Monday night chat with Wong Chen. Brought to you by the Member of Parliament for Subang. Hi, welcome to Monday Night Chat episode 39. We are shooting in my office. I am theoretically supposed to be still in bed resting from my kidney stone. But don't worry, they're just very, very tiny. I just have to drink a lot of water and let it you know, go through the system. Uh, so this week we're going to talk about uh, for Policy Monday, the issue on climate change, a continuation from last week. Number two, we're going to talk about the, we're going to do the 120 second Q&A. And lastly, we're going to introduce a new set called The Best of Subang. Hi, we're going to talk about for Policy Monday, climate change again, a uh, continuation from last week. So today we're just going to talk about the issue that everybody talks about, the two degree increase. Okay? Now, what we know is this, if there's a two degree increase uh, in temperature, you have issues regarding crop, agriculture, shoreline, sea level, coastal erosion, we're going to have more extreme weather, stronger typhoons, so and so forth. Uh, when we read the paper on a daily basis, we can see like news about the glaciers retreating. I, I climb, or well, I used to climb a lot of uh, the Himalayas, you know, the glacier is retreating. On my last trip, I went to have a look. Um, you get a story about polar bears starving, you get a story about insect population dropping. Uh, in a couple of years ago, I read an article on, you know, bears missed hibernating or missed that hibernation period. Because the temperature is a bit more, uh, bit more warmer in, in Europe. Now, if we push aside everything, let's just look at what is really happening. Uh, the, the most important document for us to understand is the Paris Agreement, which was signed in late 2016. Uh, Paris Agreement, Malaysia is a signatory, and I think most of the countries in the world. Uh, US under Obama signed it, and then when Donald Trump took over, the first thing he did was to get out the Paris Agreement. So, what is the Paris Agreement really about? It sets the target to hold the increase of global temperature to below 2 degree uh, increase. Yeah? And also to, to limit the possible increase, because you know, we're, we're still developing, right? We're still polluting and doing all the things we need to do for, for the economy or for the growth. But to limit the increase to 1.5 degree. Okay? Anything above 2 degree, uh, somewhere between 2 degrees to 4 degrees is going to be catastrophic, like horrendous, okay? Now, let's go at what the science, scientists and what the uh, people have, have, who are in the know have actually calculated. Now, if we look at the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, which is linked to the United Nations, on what their report says, okay? Now, a 2 degree increase, or 1.5 to 2 degree increase, uh, what would that entail in, in fact? Now there's, a, there's an NGO that sat down and did most of the calculation and it's not disputed, these numbers by carbon brief. Uh, they say heat wave, I suppose they look from the Western perspective, heat waves, longer periods of drought or longer periods of very high temperature that people suffer. Uh, and this has been recorded in the last two years, the highest temperature for summer, the highest temperature for winter, so and so forth. Heat waves wave will extend from one month extra to one and a half months extra. Now, fresh water. Everybody needs fresh water, and fresh water is already under under you know under attack. Uh, a 1.5 degree to 2 degree uh, increase will entail somewhere between 9 percent on the fresh water being diminished to 17 percent. So, two two degree is 17 percent. Uh, 1.5 is 9 percent of the fresh water the world would 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 decrease. Uh, extreme weather will increase somewhere between 5 percent to 7 percent more. Crops, which is basically like wheat, rice, uh, maize, of course, different category, different, somewhere in the range of three degree, at three percent to sixteen percent. So those are, those are the numbers that they forecast and they can compute, and they're not disputed. Yeah, what we're going to see is a one point five percent degree increase will create X percentage of reduction in our capacity, and also an increase in the heat wave and uh, you know extreme weather. Yeah. Uh, so what we know is, uh, these numbers are not disputed, but we, we, we cannot do much to somehow avert it. So we just try to make do with it, which is trying to stop within 1.5 to 2 degrees. Okay? Now, these numbers seem worried, but with technology, all this, you may be able to placate some of the issues. 
But the more worrying issue is this, yeah? The geopolitical breakdown from this. As a politician, uh, I can tell you, you're gonna see mass migration, you're gonna have refugee issues. Already, I mean, the Syrian refugees going to the West are really problematic. Can you imagine if this is driven by a drop in uh, wheat production by 70% or a reduction in water of 10%, fresh water? You could have wars, you can have hunger, you can have a water crisis. So the geopolitical matter is even more worrying. So what time frame do we have? The IPCC uh, and the United Nations has recently announced in March that we have about 11 years uh, to act before the situation becomes irreversible. Basically, we got until 2030. Yeah, but this is the key point. We, it doesn't mean that we can sit on our ass for 11 years and not do any, anything. Then it becomes irreversible. You have to act now in order to prevent the irreversibility. If you don't do anything from now for 11 years, it will become irreversible in 2030. You know? So that's the main point. So don't, don't, don't get it wrong when people say you've got 11 years left. You have to act now. Otherwise, we can't, we, you know, we can't have a chance to try and turn it back. Even if we act now, it depends on the degree we act. Can we still stop it or not? Yeah, okay. Now, next week, we're going to talk about Malaysia's efforts or what is Malaysia's uh, carbon footprint. We're going to also talk about, uh, you know, what can we do. In particular, we're going to look at carbon pricing. Uh, but this is the last thing I want to say about this. We know these problems are real. We read it in the news. We can see evidence of it. All scientists, 99.9% .9 scientists, all agree these numbers about, you know, the, the damage that we can inherit by 2030 is real as well. So how do we actually break this cycle? Yeah? Do you expect politicians? Do you expect corporations? Or do you expect the people? And that answer next week is very simple, is the people. The politicians of the world, including Malaysia, are controlled more or less or at least heavily influenced by corporations. Now corporations need consumers. Consumers are basically people. If people don't change their attitude, corporations are not going to change, corporations are not going to change, they're not going to influence the politicians to change. So stay tuned next week for all solutions. Hi, Q&A, 120 seconds. Okay, we have five questions. Ali, hit the button please. Thank you. First question. Uh, the previous Defence Minister, Hishamuddin, uh, has a helicopter due that apparently got no money. Money was paid out but no helicopter delivered. This is a serious allegation. We must get the MACC to move faster on this issue. We already had the MINDEF land due uh, controversy. So I think a full investigation into this is, is called for an immediate one as well. Number two, Orang Asli unhappiness in Perak and also elsewhere, I think in particular Kelantan and uh, you know, uh, in Peninsula. Now what we really have to do is we have to do a royal commission on this issue because the Orang Asli is facing their forest being diminished. Of course some have opted to integrate into society. If they want to integrate into society, we need a Felda type of program uh, to give them ample land so that they can adjust to society. So, but you know, in this 120 seconds, too short to talk. Okay, number three, Najib versus Kip Siang. They want to have a debate. By all means, two are grown adults. They want to have a debate. I think it should be done. Uh, the new Malaysia should be transparent, open on this matter. Number four, Jolo. There are new leads regarding Jolo. Uh, I think this is the thing about the, the, the police. Just tell us lah, a bit more detail. Just say, don't say just new leads. If it's in Thailand, Thailand. If it's in Vietnam, Vietnam. Is it hiding in China, then China? You know, so what does it lead, lead to? Uh, do you not want to enroll other people to the Malaysians all over the world? Can't they help in some way or another? Number five, NFC refund or uh, refund case. Now the uh, NFC people say that they're waiting for White Knight to buy them out. It doesn't matter. The key issue is this: Did they default in their loan? Okay. Did they not pay for months and months or years or years? The government should get back this money, the 250 million loan, take their assets, sell the assets, recoup what they can, and then pursue them on personal guarantee basis. Now that is what I think the Malaysian people want. That's it for Q&A this week. Hi, welcome to our new segment. It's called the Best of Subang. We're not sure whether we've shot this before. 
But uh, the idea actually came from my wife And my wife always tells me that you know, As a member of Parliament of Subang I should try and promote Subang So in this segment We're going to talk about like, Best food Best places to hang out uh, You know If there's jungle tracks Or hills to climb The best hills The best trail The best of Subang So to speak Yeah So for this very first episode We're going to talk about My favourite food Which is curry mee Or some people call it curry laksa So for the best of Subang I'm going to recommend Teki uh, which is a fish ball noodle shop in uh, SS18-6 They used to be in SS15 and I was very close to my office So once a week I'll force my entire staff to go and eat there They are famous for their fish ball, you know, their ching tong so to speak But I love their curry, I think it's really one of the best curry noodle uh, in Subang So hey guys, in this segment of what's good in Subang Boss has asked me to go around and ask people Where is the best place that they had curry beef before so, I'm going to the Adun's office, which is just a block away from our parliament office, just to ask the staff in the Adun's office where is the best curry meal they've probably had. Lah. So let's go. So where's the best curry mee? No curry mee, not uh, chicken rice. Uh. No, no, curry mee, curry mee. Curry mee only. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> wait, 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 wait. Sampo lama? Sampo lama, Puchong Jaya curry mee, best. <laughs> Karimi in Subang area is restaurant drilling Karimi in Damai Utama. 